It's time for The Story Behind the Person, featuring lively, in-depth conversation with compelling guests from our community. And here is our host, Jonathan Van Bilsen. Thank you and welcome to our show. Today we're actually in a brand new studio with a brand new set, and it's really exciting. I'm told every possible technical glitch has been eliminated. So thank you very much for being here. My guest today is Richard Park. He has an interesting career. Richard is the Vice President of Operations with one of the most successful craft breweries in the region. And today we're going to find out all about Richard and his craft. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So you are the Vice President of Operations for the one of the most successful breweries in the area, as I mentioned, the Old Flame Brewery, with two operations, one in Port Perry and one in Newmarket, correct? And so just as, as a 30,000 foot level, what is your exact uh, role there? Like as Vice President of Operation, do you oversee everything? Yeah, so um, it's a fantastic question. And I really have the privilege at Old Flame to really kind of uh, explore and, and manage uh, the processes from A to Z, whether it's you know grain in the form of malted barley all the way to the finished product in, tr uh, in our pint classes. Okay. Um, and so in a lot of ways, the role is extremely expansive and um, there really isn't much that uh, I don't have my fingers on there. Well, that's good, that's good. So you get to mop the floors one day and you get to look after making beer the other day. Mop the floors, mold on the walls, everything in between. We're gonna talk more about the beer a little bit later on because I'm really intrigued about how you make beer because I have no idea. But, but I would like to find out a little bit more about Richard Park. So you were born in the Toronto area, right? Yes. A as were your parents? Or? No, actually, um, depending on how far back you want to go. Uh, oh, maybe seven or eight generations would be about as far as we, can, we have time for today. The, uh, the story um, of our family, it, it, you know, my parents are both from South Korea. Okay. Um, I'm the son of a, a city girl from Seoul and a, a country boy um, just uh, in the northeast region of Korea. Ah. Um, they both immigrated to um, Canada when they were younger. Uh, my father immigrated here as a student uh, in his 20s. Uh, my mother got to uh, Canada in her late 20s as well with, alongside her mother. And they met uh, here and yep, the rest they met is here history. And the rest is history. Great. That's right. I'm intrigued because I'm supposed to be heading to Korea later on this year, to South Korea later on this year. So I'm, Amazing. I'm excited, but I may pick your brain a little bit more about that part yeah, of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk about that. That'd be interesting. Um, so you grew up in, uh, where, in Toronto and Woodbridge? And you mentioned Woodbridge, I think. When we so um, my kind of uh, regional track record is uh, I was born in North York. Okay. I spent a little bit of my childhood in Woodbridge. Right. I um, grew up pr predominantly and spent most of my childhood and you know adolescent years in Newmarket. Okay. Uh, then went to school in the city. Right. Um, had a gig before Old Flame that kind of took me all over the place right. too. But I remember I read something recently, uh, some article on you, and it said something about you were the only kid who wasn't Italian in Woodbridge waving a flag during the World Cup soccer. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> Woodbridge was, at the time, um, I had Italian neighbors on both sides, you know, tomato sauce at home, uh, wine stomping in the garage, and I remember in the early World Cup, yeah. I, had a, I was a Korean kid waving the Italian flag around. <laughs> That's cute. Um, so you attended Newmarket Secondary School. Yep. And did you, what did you do during school? Any part-time jobs or anything? I know you were big in football and basketball and things like that, right? Yeah, so I think um, for me, I was the type of student that, you know, I didn't hate going to class, but I went to school for everything else. Right. Um, I, I played on all the sports teams. Um, you know, we, we took part in student council and I was the president of high school um, at the time. You know, athletic council, just everything about school that wasn't in class, that right. was my forte. Yeah, I can identify with that. The, and, and you met a fellow named Drew Doak there, right? Who, and that sort of got you involved into a little bit of, of the, the beer end, right? Yeah, so um, one of the things that you get to know about me is that uh, we have a very tight-knit group of friends. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but one of the fellows, his name is Drew Doak, and through him, I got a chance to meet Jack. And again, um, really that relationship uh, transpired into what uh, Old Flame and, and my partnership and my work there has transpired for, to be. For people who don't know, Jack Doak is the person who started the Old Flame. Brewery, That's right. right? Like, dur during your high school years, you were president of the student council, yep. which must have been interesting to say the least. Definitely. Um, I think that was the, probably the first opportunity uh, in my life where I learned that a lot of the work that you, you know, uh, get into to get to a position but the work actually starts when you get there. Right. Um, and so that was probably my first kind of opening into that reality, for sure. Okay. 
and you hung out at the Dokes residence on weekends and evenings and stuff like that because yeah. the food was good and they're nice people. Right? Definitely. Um, so you played football, you played basketball. Yeah, I played both. I played volleyball. Um, again, just that kid kind of stayed busy. I loved sports. Um, I loved competing. I loved um, the team atmosphere. Um, that was really, again, kind of um, where I really found myself uh, thriving. Okay. In and, team and you did have time to get to the odd class as well, right? Definitely. Okay. So after high school, I understand you went to, was it York University? Yep. And with the intent of becoming what? What were you going to do when you grew up sort of thing? So when I was in high school, um, I was, again, that kind of kid who had a, a very expansive view of the world. I really found everything interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, one of the pieces of advice I got was, you know, if you don't know exactly what you want to get into, um, business and the world of business is definitely a really interesting um, place to study. Right. And so I was fortunate enough to um, kind of begin my uh, business career at the Schuler School of Business at York University. Okay, excellent. So you didn't really know what you wanted to do once you got out of school, but it was going to be something that was business related, some sort of a marketing type of a type of a job. Yeah, I think um, when I got to business school, um, again, it was an amazing opportunity to get um, idea of what accounting is, what finance is, what right. marketing is, and, and really see the expansive view of it. Very quickly, again, I, I didn't really commit to one side. I stayed a generalist, and okay. um, which led my uh, first move into the career of uh, global management trainee at Labatt, which allowed me to move from one function of the business to, a, to another. Okay, so, sorry, global management trainee yeah. at Labatt Breweries. So what exactly does that involve? Yeah, so that's also a, a really, um, it's a highlight of my life in the sense that uh, what Labatt did at the time was they took uh, fresh grads right out of university. Right. And what they were uh, aiming to do was uh, look for their next kind of next generation of future leaders. Okay. And at, what they did was they took students, they put them in rotations in the marketing field, in the finance field, in the supply and operations field right. to give them kind of an overview of the beer business. Okay. And how, how, so how did you get into that? How did they choose you? I love telling this story. Um, <laughs> it was seven rounds of interviews. There was a flight out to St. Louis in the North American headquarters. Um, there Labatt's, was- Labatt's headquarters in St. Louis. So they're a, a, a multinational conglomerate. Um, okay. So they're, Labatt is a Canadian company that was purchased by a Belgian company, purchased by an American, purchased by a Brazilian. So the, okay. you know, the wow. story is quite extensive. Um, again, I was very fortunate, right? Um, you know, the interview process was, uh, was really extensive, uh, but as a result, um, they selected seven of us and I got a good chance to spend uh, the beginning of my career uh, learning about the beer business wow. um, uh, with some really special people. That's great, that's interesting. So that's when you sort of got an idea that this is maybe a field that you wanna continue the rest of your life in possibly different areas, but, but certainly within that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, coming out of business school, you always have that intent that you're gonna be uh, focusing on the commercial side of the business, whether it's sales, marketing, or finance. But after a stint in operations and supply, which I really had no place to be in, and that's the brewery side, Right. that's kind of where I caught the bug, and I said, yeah wow, you can make a living making beer. And so that's kind of what progressed uh, the next right. steps in my career. I mean, there are worse ways to make a living. Definitely. From, from so, so your next step then was you went over to, to Jack's house and said, hey, I worked at Labatt's, I want to work for your brewery? Is that, or was there a little bit beyond that? It actually, it's really interesting in the sense that uh, when I got my job uh, in 2014, mm -hmm. um, that was also around the same period Jack was starting to write the business plan for Old Flame. Right. Um, and so I remember a very interesting conversation we had then is, hey, I'm starting Old Flame, you're going to Labatt. We kind of joked at the idea that our cross would intersect. Yeah. But at the time, it was a pipe dream. Right. right. And so fast forward a few years and when it happened, you know, it's, uh, it's really funny how life can unfold that way. How did you actually reconnect? So before actually coming to Old Flame, uh, what ended up happening, like I said, I kind of caught the operation supply bug. Right. Um, but you're not going to get that kind of technical uh, training at Labatt. They're not going to teach you how to make a beer. Right. Um, right. And so what I did was I left the company um, and I enrolled in the Brewmasters program at Niagara College where I got to work with uh, Jonathan Downing, the Brewmaster professor there. Okay. And I got my technical training from the school there. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot of intersections in the sense that Jonathan Downing, the Brewmaster professor, was also one of the key contributors to the start of Old Flame as well. Oh, okay. I didn't and know so, that. you know, I had my run in with John. I had my run-in with Jack, right. and so that was a possibility upon graduation, right. 
Nothing for certain, but you know we were very fortunate that a lot of things lined up the right way. Okay, so it's interesting. The the brew. I know nothing about making beer. I really don't. So the brewmaster course that you took um, would would teach you everything from the ingredients of beer, how to ferment it, how to like every element of. It. Is that right? Absolutely. So the brewmaster's program at Niagara College. The reason it was born. It was because that there was because of the proliferation of the craft beer industry in Ontario about ten years ago, right? And so it was a response um, to the industry boom. Okay. And so what they were doing was uh, training these students so that a rising industry would have a pool of talent that they could source from. Okay. And so if you can imagine in the beginning, like that first cohort of grads, right? They were getting seven offers. Right. From right. seven breweries. Right. Fast forward, you know, now we got a little bit more. And so like the pendulum has a little shifted. Okay. Um, but that was the initial um, reason for the program. So most of those graduates would go to the craft industry. Very few would go to the, the, the big beer. Companies, Predominantly right? so. Right. And approximately how many craft breweries would there be in Ontario? Do you have any handle on that? I do, because it's one of my favorite facts is when Old Flame started and Jack wrote the business plan. Right. Which was, you said, 2014? Uh, 2013, 2014, so it's about uh, seven, eight years ago now. Okay. In his business plan, he ended up writing that, uh, about the competitive landscape. Okay. And I, re I read it recently and it said uh, he recognized 30 competitors in Ontario. Okay. Fast forward to today, right. we have around 380 craft breweries really? in Ontario. Wow. Um, with a handful of pending uh, breweries in the making, as, as well as um, uh, a group of breweries that that are called contract breweries that don't own their own facilities but uh, market their own beers um, through channels like the LCBO. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So they make the beer, they just don't sell it directly. They sell it through the That's LCBO. That's right. Okay. As, as does the Old Flame, I'm told, right? You sell through the LCBO as well, right? Yes. But we, we also sell through our own breweries and, right. and other right. multitude of channels as well. So of these 300 some odd breweries, is this a fad? Like, is, is craft beer going to be here for a long time? Is it sort of just riding a crest and it's on its way down? Is cider going to be the next big thing or something that we haven't thought of yet? Uh, so Really cool question. Um, and so I'll try to take it in two pieces. So the first is, um, it's definitely here to stay. And the reason I know that and the reason I believe that is I kind of look back in history. So the Canadian Ontario beer landscape, a lot of it is uh, the way it is because of uh, um, our history in Prohibition. Right. Prior to Prohibition, it looked a lot like what it looks like today. Every community had their kind of watering hole. They had their local brewery. Okay. Post or during prohibition, post prohibition, a lot of those small businesses failed and they weren't right. able to survive. The ones that did survive, like the Molsons, like the okay, Labatt's. Okay, so they grew and They kind of conglomerate, they, exactly. Right. They consolidated, they became bigger. And now um, you're starting to see a modernization of right. our you know, beer regulations, beer uh, rules and things like that. And so we're kind of starting to get back to what it was. Prior to prohibition. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. So as long as we don't have another prohibition, that would <laughs> yeah. be fine, right? Exactly. As, as a brewmaster, what do you do? Like, what, what's your day consist of as a brewmaster? Yeah, so... Um, and I don't mean as the vice president of operations, but I just mean, you know, just in a nutshell. So I'll try to answer that in a couple of ways. I think uh, the title of a brewmaster um, is the greatest um, title that you can receive um, in a brewery. It comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. Right. Um, and ultimately, uh, a brewmaster's promise to an organization and to all of its fans is to be the ultimate custodian of quality. Okay. That, and especially now where there's 380 options. Yeah, no kidding. If no kidding. someone has decided to pick yours, you better promise that that beer that they're going to spend their money and their time on, that it delivers. And consistent too, right? Absolutely. To so you have moved now to Port Perry with your wife and child? Yes. And you're enjoying that? Um, I've been commuting to Port Perry, to Old Flame, from right. the city. Right. So now you're here and you love it. For the past four years. And for those four years. I'm going to hold you there, Richard. We're going to continue on. We've got a few commercial messages we want to get to. We're going to continue on. I want to find out all about the beer industry. So we'll be right back after these messages. Hello, I'm Jonathan Van Belsen for Photos and Travel, where we bring the world to your doorstep. During times like this, when traveling is next to impossible, a great way to see the world is through my television show, Photos and Travel, featured on the Rogers Television Network and YouTube. I've had the privilege of traveling to over 100 countries, and I've written dozens of articles about different locales and some of the experiences I've encountered. Together we'll explore the four corners of the globe. Join me as we follow elephants in Africa's Atosha Pan, 
and walk in the history of Jerusalem. We have an entire episode dedicated to the country of Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, where we explore tea plantations and discover all kinds of wildlife. What better way than to discover the museums of Paris than from the comfort of your own living room? Or watch a Mardi Gras parade in New Orleans. And of course, one of the most memorable episodes is the city of Petra in Jordan and walking 30,000 steps from one end to another. In one of the shows, we visit the surrounding area of London and walk among the Druids and the Kings. And of course, being Dutch, my favorite city was Amsterdam, complete with windmills, canals, and bicycles. Join me on the Rogers Network or visit YouTube and search for Jonathan Van Bilsen's Photos and Travel. I'll be your tour guide and together we'll explore this wonderful planet we live on. Welcome back. My guest today is Richard Park, Vice President of Operations for the Old Flame Brewery in Port Perry and Newmarket. So Richard, tell me a little bit about the Newmarket operation. It's fairly new, correct? Absolutely. So we took on a, a very brave project um, in the middle of the global pandemic um, to continue to spread and grow this brand. Um, really, um, in a location and in a town and in an area where a lot of the original thinking for this brand uh, was meant for. Uh, we opened a uh, 1950s old fire hall, right. um, and it works, as you can imagine, works really well with the brand. Right. Um, so we spent really the... This is the fire hall in Newmarket, the old fire hall in Newmarket? That's right. Okay. At the, the top of Old Main Street. Right. Um, Newmarket's Main Street has uh, developed tremendously ever since my time there. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was through there not long ago. I, I could not believe how it has totally transitioned from what I would consider back in the 80s to be kind of... Not, not necessarily full of good shops and things like that, but now the streets are lined with picturesque little stores. It's, an, it's, it's really transitioned into an amazing town. The town, um, the leadership under John Taylor and his team, they've done uh, some incredible work. And in a lot of ways for us, going to the fire hall um, is just kind of showing up to the dance a little bit late. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, uh, we, we use most of the pandemic um, to prepare, to get the uh, site ready, to get, put all the equipment in, to get um, initial recipes out the door. Um, so it's been a it's been a tremendous uh, adventure and it's been amazing. Now I heard that initially the plan was to open the brewery in Newmarket in that fire hall, hence the name Old Flame. And then through complications, you ended up moving here. Is that is that the way it worked? So a lot of the story is actually based on serendipity in the sense where the initial location that Jack was looking for and that wrote, wrote the business plan for was in fact this 1950s fire hall on Main Street. Right. Um, but long story short, the opportunity wasn't able to uh, come to fruition at the time. Right. And the the story of Port Perry is really interesting in the sense that um, Port Perry is the town that Jack and his family used to drive through right. on the way to their family cottage. and. Um, as you know, this old building, uh, 1880s fire, um, sorry, horse carriage factory right. that was once an LCBO, right. um, caught the attention of Jack and, and the family and, and uh, the rest is history since then. Oh, no, it's an amazing building. It, it was a two-story building and then it was demolished in the fire. It was bought by someone, I believe it was a veterinarian or something, who had a piece of land and they built a single story. It's, it's been a, a sock making company. It's been a sewing company. It's been everything. And then it was the uh, LCBO for quite a while up until I guess a few months or a few years before Jack bought it, or just up until Jack bought it, I suppose. And he totally transformed it, brought it back to the rafters. And I know if you go inside and you look up, you can see the actual uh, char marks from the fire, that, that the second fire that took place in there, which, which is amazing. It's, a, it's absolutely incredible. And, and the fact that we actually didn't know that existed until we bought it, until we started working on it, and we went, this was clearly meant to be. Yeah. Um, and, and just, you know, a uh, running joke that we have at Old Flame, which we're starting to take very, very seriously, is um, something that we're, we believe that we're very good at, is that we're very good at um, putting breweries in buildings that have no right to have a brewery in. Um, so that's a 1880s uh, horse carriage factory off the list. That's a 1950s fire hall off the list. And I'm excited to see maybe what's next. Well, perhaps a, a television studio would be a nice place to, to put a brewery. The so the Old Flame story, I, I know that you folks have music on a fairly regular basis. Is that both in Newmarket and in Port Perry operations as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, it's critical and it's core to our business. Um, okay. At Old Flame, we believe that beer brings people together. Okay. Um, and, and that, you know, there's three main components to that in the sense that beer, that's what we do and beer is a start for us. Um, people, 
um, and then this idea of coming together. And so for us, our job is to faci facilitate the spaces right. for people to come together. Right. And whether that's enjoying music, enjoying some local food, uh, local vendors, whatever it may be, um, beer is, is going to help facilitate that experience for us. And you're also very pet friendly, right? Absolutely. Because I know you folks support, amongst many things, the dog guide uh, walk and a process for dog guides, for, for people to get dog guides. And I see a lot of people with their dogs on a Saturday afternoon enjoying some, some really great live music, uh, uh, a few drinks here and there, a little bit of beer. And uh, the dogs are just all over the place just having a great time, which is amazing in this day and age because you don't see that very often anymore, right? Definitely not. And I got two of my own and it's, uh, it's an absolute blast to bring them to the brewery. Well, that's great. So you have two dogs and you live in town. You've got a, a daughter, right? Yep. And uh, you don't have to commute anymore. No, the You're commute is a, it's a, it's a tough commute, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the downside of that is that you get to work all the time, right? When you started, when, when Old Flame started, there were basically three beers, right? There was Hazy Blonde, there was Brunette, and there was Red. Correct. Right? Um, so I don't know enough about beer to know. I know that they're different, but I couldn't tell you what the differences are. So why would you choose those three particular type of beers? Is, are they most common? Is that why they went with them? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so seven years ago, um, another thing that we, def you know, we used to define our DNA and who we all are about is, you know, when people zag, we like to zig, or when people zig, we like to zag. Right. And at the time, the craft beer industry, one of the things that you started to see, and it was highly uh, proliferated, is this idea of, you know, IPAs and ales and right. um, very interesting beers that were coming out. Right. One of the things we identified, though, is because everybody else was doing that, in the marketplace, there was missing um, a brewery who was focusing on very clean, classic, traditional recipes, like the German-inspired recipes that we have. Right. And so for us, those three recipes are very different in nature, but they ultimately try to serve the same thing, which is cold, crisp, refreshing, and clean. Interesting. I know one of your folks a few years ago actually went to Germany to learn about making beer there and um, brought some of that information back, which I, f I found very interesting because I think to me, Germany and beer are sort of is synonymous at, at one point, right? Because that, that's, I guess that's where it began or, or certainly where, where it became publicized. What, what other type of beers do you manufacture and why? Yeah, so the way we see our portfolio, um, generally speaking, we see it from two perspectives. So one, we look at uh, what we call our core lineup. And in that core lineup is what we call our core lager series okay. or our craft lager series. And that, again, is predominantly focused on this German-inspired um, German recipes that focus on cleanliness, refreshing, and, and clean. Right. And then on the other hand, um, we like to call it either our seasonal lineup or our experimental lineup. Okay. Um, one of the things that's uh, very predominant in our industry is brewers are naturally experimental, naturally right. a little bit you know, on the fringe yeah. uh, per se. And so uh, we definitely participate in that space as well. And in a lot of ways, having new market open it allows us to focus on our loggers here in Port Perry, okay. and then it allows us to dedicate another facility completely um, to our seasonals and experimentals. So you actually brew beer in both locations? Absolutely. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. I thought you, you made it here and shipped it over there, but okay. Interesting. So w why do you come out with a new beer? Like if everything is working well, if it ain't broke, why fix it sort of thing? Is it just to experiment or is it because people want it? Um, I, I'd like to believe it's a little bit of both, okay. um, but the third element that I'll add to that is beer, off, while often it is the center of the show, it often also serves as a, a wonderful accompaniment mm -hmm. to either a great meal right. or certain occasions. Right. And so we like, as a team, we will kind of take back and we'll start to brainstorm what are the certain occasions we want our beers to be a part of? Okay. And as a result, what are the right recipes and flavor profiles and ingredients that best suit those occasions? Right. So you'll come out with a beer and, and if it does fairly well, do you add that to your lineup forever? or is it just intended to be seasonal? No, that's a great question too. So a lot of, so we started with three, like you said, right. but our core lineup now is um, six beers. Okay. And those three that were added on, they all started as experimentals as well. Okay. And so depending on their reception and how people enjoy them, and if we see a, a validity in the marketplace, um, for that recipe, then we'll kind of graduate it into the core series. And you take suggestions from people, or do you do you find beers in other loca locations um, that that have a, a different or unique taste, and you try and match that? That that sort of thing. It's a little bit of everything. Well, that's the fun of it. Is we can source our inspiration from all sorts of places and people, whether it's our customers, whether it's our team, whether it's um, our partners in accounts and bars and restaurants, um, as well as just you know 
what are the what are some of the special things other breweries out there are doing? What's your what's your top selling beer? Like not not to, by brand per se, but but what type of beer would be your top selling beer? Our top selling style um, is the lager. Okay. And and predominantly there's two two big different styles, the lager and the ale. Okay. And really the the primary difference um, is how they're produced okay. and uh, the level of uh, fermentation cleanliness that they can okay. provide. And so lagers, they're generally speaking, they're like that clean, crisp, easy drinking. Okay. So they tend to be the lighter ones in color sort of thing, like a blonder color? Uh, so the colors can range. Um, okay. So as you know, so the hazy blonde, red, and brunette, they're, all three of them are lagers. Okay. But all right. as you know, they range in color from light straw right. all the way to amber, all okay. the way to uh, a brunette. Right. So, so how, how do you, what do you start with? So you get some water, you throw some hops in it, so a little bit of sugar and sit back? Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> Let me make a note of that. I'm going to try that tonight. So beer, uh, the, the four main ingredients with beer are malted barley, mm -hmm. hops, yeast, and water. Okay. Generally, any, like any type of combination of the four mm -hmm. can get you most of the beers out on the marketplace now. Okay. Um, and so, generally speaking, you know, a high-level overview of how it's made is, you know, you uh, take malted barley, you infuse it with warm water, you turn those starches into fermentable sugars, which end up becoming the food for the yeast. Okay. And um, if you know, you remember your uh, grade nine biology, sure. um, the uh, byproduct of yeast consuming sugar is alcohol and carbon dioxide. Okay. And uh, that's kind of uh, the process of fermentation and we'll age out the beer uh, to settle out some of the uh, flavors and the profile. Okay. And uh, let's say the turnover for your beer is, is let's say one week, hypothetically, it doesn't matter where it is. So you brew a batch today and that's gonna last you for a week, right? Then you, f you realize by Wednesday, oops, I'm out. How long does it take to actually make a new batch of beer? Yeah, so, so the funny thing and one of the areas of differentiation for us in the marketplace, again, we have to figure out a way to stand out on uh, the market of 380 breweries, right. is generally speaking, an average beer will take about two weeks okay. to produce, ferment, and have it in a finished uh, container. Okay. For us, the minimum time is four weeks. And that's, that's part of the lagering process. That's why it comes out so clean. That's why it comes out so, um, I'm so soft too. So, so if I want to have a certain beer and you're out of it and you're going to be out of it for two weeks, is that when Jack takes his vice president of operations aside and has a little chat with him? Precisely. <laughs> okay. So that's not a position you want to be in, right? No, I, I wouldn't be doing a very okay. good job if that was. But you do have flexibility in that you've got yes, a lot of different brews, yes. right? And, and it's only natural that you would run out, of, especially new ones, because you don't know how well they're going to sell, correct? That's right. Yeah. So I get that. Um, so a little bit about the old flame as far as a working place. You have great people. I've met a number of the staff. They're fantastic people. Um, it, w what do you like best about it, about working there? So between, it all starts with Jack. And you don't have to work because Jack's not going to watch no, the show. I, for sure. <laughs> but you know, in any organization, before you start talking about the team, mm -hmm. I think it's always right where you start to think about the source, right. the single source. And a lot of the culture, a lot of the belief systems, a lot of the values that we have as a team, it starts with Jack. And uh, directly with me, what he's allowed me to do is to invest in, uh, and train mm -hmm. and develop people internally. Right. And as a result, the culture flourishes. The, you know, the people that we've had have been here since day one. Right. Um, and so as a result, anytime we bring in new people, uh, the culture is very much defined and it's something that we're extremely proud of. And I also assume that the role that you've taken on as, as VP of operations, which is a relatively new position for the company, because it's a small company that Definitely. is growing relatively well, but at a very successful pace, that allows time for Jack to come up with new ideas, new concepts sort of thing to free up his time uh, a bit. Is that right? Absolutely. That's excellent. Um, Jack is a, a serial entrepreneur through and through. Right. Um, him and I, one of the beautiful um, synergies that we have in our relationship is that, you know, we cover up a lot of our weak spots. And so um, what that role really does is allows Jack to focus on what he does best. Right. And then, um, you know. Excellent. Richard, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. I've learned more about beer than I ever, ever knew. I, I certainly um, will, will try, I won't try and make my own beer because it's too, much, it's too easy to simply go and, go and get some from you. But thank you so much for being part of our show today. Very much appreciated, very much enjoyed it. Absolute pleasure, thanks for having me. 
And thank you for being here as well. Hopefully you'll join us next month and every month when we bring you the story behind the person. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen, and we'll see you right here on Rogers TV.